Okay, I think we'll get started. Today we're going to be talking about building multilingual websites in Drupal 7. And we're going to be focusing a lot on uh, the options that Drupal 7 has for us that we didn't have in Drupal 6, so things like entity translation. Um, and we'll be uh, walking through the process of, of configuring a Drupal site and talking about some of the challenges that you face as site builders. Uh, my name is Suzanne Kennedy, and I work at Evolving Web in Montreal, where we do an awful lot of multilingual site building, it being a very bilingual place. Hello, everyone. My name is Florian Lorten. I'm from Wunderkraut. We're based in Munich, Germany. Um, yeah, I'll be talking about the, the content translation part, but for now, I'll let Susan, uh, Suzanne do, do her, her part on pretty much everything else. Right, so this is the outline we have today. First of all, talking more about planning the site and questions to ask before you start building. Um, and then we'll be walking through the process of, of setting up the site and translating the different aspects of Drupal. And then we'll wrap up with some of the outstanding challenges we have in Drupal 7 and where things are going for Drupal 8 with the multilingual initiative. So to start off, what, are, what do we mean when we say a multilingual site? This can mean quite a number of things in Drupal. At its most basic, we're talking about a foreign language site uh, where you would install a language other than English on your site using the locale module and where the user interface would be in the other language as well as all the content and other elements of Drupal like blocks and menus. And then adding a level of complexity to that, we have multilingual sites, so websites where more than one language is enabled on the site. And here, in addition to, um, in addition to locale, we need the I18N module, which allows us to translate things like menus and blocks. And because we have more than one language on the site, we want to be able to flag pieces of content as being in a particular language, which we can do with the locale module. And then adding one final level of complexity, we have multilingual sites with translation. And this means that you have a, a language switcher on your site and you can switch the language back and forth. Um, and the content on the site is mapped together in translation sets. So if you're looking at the About Us page of a website in English and you switch the language of the site into French, then that content is, is mapped to the French translation and, and you see that there. And in addition to locale and I18N, uh, for these types of websites, we need a module to do some type of translation. So either the core content translation module or the entity translation module, which Florian's going to talk about quite a bit in, in the next part of the presentation. So before you start building a multilingual site, there are a number of questions that you should figure out. So if you have a client, you need to sit down and, and talk about these with your client, or if, if you're building the site for yourself, you need to figure these things out. First of all, what type of language support are you providing across languages? So what type of language experience are you providing to users? And a lot of the time, this comes down to the resources you have to actually come up with the translations as well as what your users' expectations are. So are you creating a really consistent user experience across languages where everything is translated, or are there going to be certain elements that are missing in certain languages? In a lot of cases, it's just the most important content of the site or just the static content of the site that gets translated. So in, in certain situations, you're going to want to create a fully symmetric experience across languages. So uh, this is a site I, I built for Travelocity last year, and all the content had to be translated into eight languages before it was published. So there were really strict res restrictions on, on um, content being consistent across languages. But in other situations, you're not going to have that luxury, and you're going to have a lot of content that's left untranslated. So this, is, this would be an example of a site where if you switch the language from 
uh, French to English, a lot of the content just disappears and the menus are much shorter, for example. And in a lot of other cases, you'll have sites where there's mixed language experience. So this is my corporate website, and at some point we translated all the static content on the site, but things like, prof uh, things like uh, user profiles and um, portfolio items and blog posts don't get translated. So if you switch the site into French, you'll see all of that content in English. Which leads to the next question of, of whether or not you want to show untranslated content on your website. In a lot of cases, I think it makes sense to show untranslated content. On the left here, we have um, an example from Node One's blog, and they have a lot of users who speak Swedish and English. And so, because they have that type of audience, it makes sense to show content that hasn't been translated into the other language. And, on, and then on the other side, we have an example of comments from TripAdvisor.com. And they also show untranslated comments, which are valuable to users because you can see the, the rating that users have given. You can see the number of comments that a restaurant or a hotel has received. In other situations, it's, it's not going to make sense to show translated content. So you can choose to, to hide untranslated content. Um, this is just a corporate blog where content that is translated is, is shown, and content that's not in the current language of the site is hidden. A really important thing to figure out before you start building the site is whether or not the expectation is that the language is related to a region. A lot of people expect that when a, when a site, uh, when you switch the language of the site, somehow the currency also changes and the time zone also changes. And we're not really going to get into that in, uh, in the talk today. It's kind of out of scope for this session, but that adds a lot of complexity to the site, and so you really need to figure out whether that's a requirement. Um, for example, when you try and switch the language, I think on apple.com, you're presented with an actual region selector. So you're not selecting the language so much as the, uh, the location. Uh, it's also a really good idea to try and figure out who's doing the translation. So, so what's the process for translating things like user interface and comments? Is the, is the content always being translated from French to English, for example? Um, is the translation going to be outsourced to a third party? Also important to figure out whether the administrative UI needs to be translated. If your administrators or your translators are logging in and they need to see the site um, and they don't speak the, the default language of the site, if they don't speak English and you have to translate all of that administrative UI, that can be a lot of overhead. Uh, if, especially if translations for the languages you're using aren't, uh, there aren't a lot of translations contributed already. Uh, this is a really important one that I would really recommend figuring out uh, before you even start prototyping your website, what the default language of the site is. And this there's two components of this. First of all, uh, considering what the language the majority of your users speak, um, because the default language is used by Drupal uh, to determine the, the language fallback for the site um, when determining what, what language to display the site in. And also, for site administrators, um, when they're entering configuration settings in a particular language, that, that language should be the, the default language of the site. So hopefully your site administrators and your site users speak the same language, and, and that'll be the default language of the site, but if they don't, then um, you might have a more difficult decision here. In a lot of cases, the language also affects the, the design of the site and has some impact on, um, on theming. So for example, some languages take up a lot more space than others, and you'll need to take that into account. Um, also, certain fonts that you might want to use might not support all the characters that the languages you're using would require. And if you're using right to left languages, you'll probably have to add more uh, CSS files to make sure that you have a layout that reflects the, the right to left 
uh, mode. So you can see here that the sidebar would be on the right for right to left languages, whereas it would be on the left for left to right languages. Um, and finally, uh, something to figure out by looking through your wireframes is what type of your text you're translating in Drupal. Drupal has, has all kinds of, of text that it stores and um, from, from content to, to user interface strings. And it's a really good idea to look at where all this text is coming from. So you have UI text and we have more content like text. Uh, first of all, we have variables. So these are strings that are stored in the system table in Drupal, things like the site title and the site slogan. And then we have text that's stored in code. So this is text that's passed through the translation function. Um, and, and this would be code like Drupal core, modules that you're installing, as well as themes. We also have user entered strings. So you know when you're configuring views, you, add, you end up adding a lot of text to Drupal. So you're adding uh, maybe a title for your view, maybe the read more link. Uh, in, this, in my example here, I have the label for a field in a view. And all this text that you're adding as the administrator also has to get translated. Then we have content, so, so nodes, uh, and other entities like comments and users and taxonomy terms. And finally, we have uh, something called text groups, so things that don't really fall into these other categories that are kind of, kind of like content, but they're not entities. So menu items and, and blocks and, um, and things like field settings. So taking an inventory of all these things, looking at your wireframes and trying to figure out what uh, text is going to have to be translated is, is a good step when planning your multilingual site. Um, so now moving on to actually uh, building your site. Uh, the first step would be to set up the languages, install the languages that, you're, that you need to support. Um, and, and choosing a, a default language for the site. And, uh, and one thing that people struggle with a bit is this uh, detection, language detection and selection configuration. So, you know, you've installed a couple languages on your site. Now Drupal needs to know how to determine which language to display the site in. And usually this is kind of obvious, right, like the, the, um, the language is specified often in the path to the, the page you're looking at or in the domain. Um, but there's, there's other factors that can determine what language Drupal displays and, um, and Drupal needs a fallback in case the language isn't specified in the URL. So this would be a typical configuration. Um, the, first, the first method of selection that we're using here would be the URL. Um, but if the language isn't in the URL, then Drupal will look at the user's profile to see if the user has a language preference there, and it'll use that. And if the user doesn't have a language preference, then it'll look at the browser settings, because your, your browser actually has a language setting, so if, if that's set to be English or French, then Drupal will use that. And finally, if, if there's no language set in, in any of these methods, then Drupal will use the, the default language of the site and display that as the fallback. So for example, if you go to exam, using the configuration I just showed you, if you, if you went to example.com slash fr slash user, then Drupal would show the site in French. But if I just went to slash user uh, and, I'm, and I'm not logged in, so I don't have any language preferences in my profile, then it would just go to slash user because it would use my, my browser settings. So the next step would be translating the UI of the site. So we already talked a lot about where the different types of, of UI that you can translate. And the first one is variables. And to translate variables in Drupal, you need to use the IATN variable module. So it's a variable is a sub-module in the IATN suite. And the first step is to actually select which variables you want to translate. 
And in Drupal 6, we had to use this uh, by adding these variables to the settings.php file, which was a little bit of a clunky solution. So now in Drupal 7, we can do this through the UI. So there's a page you can use to select which of these variables you actually want to translate. So I've selected site title and site slogan. Um, and then to actually translate these things, I need to go to the page where they're set in Drupal. So the site information page has uh, some of the, the core variables on it, like site title and slogan. And those fields are, are marked as, as multilingual variables. And to actually enter the translations, I need to switch the language of the site. So if I wanted to enter the French site title, I'd need to switch the, the site into French. And for that reason, the variable module inserts a language switcher into the page if there's variables that are configured on the page you're looking at. Um, and some variables are not text settings, and you might wonder why you would want to uh, translate these. And in some cases, you might want to translate something like the time zone of your site if the time zone was dependent on the user's language. Um, so now we're going to move on to translating UI strings that are stored in code. So for example, if you wanted to translate the login button in the user login form. So there's a, a search UI that you'd use for this, uh, the translation interface. And it's not the most easy to use uh, translation UI in Drupal. Um, but basically you enter the search, you enter into the search the string that you want to translate and it'll show you the results and you can edit the translations that way. Uh, and for user entered strings, it's really similar. So um, for strings that you've entered, say, when configuring views or another module, then You'll use the same. Uh, you'll use the same translation interface to find the the strings that you you want to translate. Um, and the catch with things like this is that Drupal is actually using Drupal is actually using the English string as the key. So if you change the string in views, like if you change the original. English string in, in your views configuration, then this is, is going to break. So um, that's why it can be really important to map out your, the translations of your user interface strings in advance. Um, and now Florian's going to talk about translating content. So translating content is kind of a, of a different beast. Because all these user interface translation that Suzanne has talked about, these are generally things that need to be done once when you build a site. And then as long as there's no major modification to the functional functionality of the website, there's nothing that needs to be translated. The strings don't change, and there's, there's no need to, to translate text. However, content is typically the part of the website that is changed regularly. And this is not necessarily going to be done by the people who built the website, but it's going to be done by the people who entered the content, maybe translators who are, well, who are working on the site specifically to just translate the content. And so in this case, we really need to spend some more time focusing on what is going to be the translator's experience. We don't want to show them that table that you just showed, we want to spend more time just figuring out what is the translation workflow. And we need to make sure that the translation model that we have is something that our editors or translators can understand. So for translating content, there's actually two major models. The first one on the left is the no translation. This is the, me the translation method that you get by default when you enable the content translation module that comes with Drupal core. In this translation model, you have content, pieces of content, and when you translate a piece of content, well, you have the 
the English content that was created first, and then you say, I want to add a translation in French, and I want add one in German, and at this point, you just create additional nodes that just have a connection that's saved in the database that says these three different nodes are actually the same thing in different languages. The drawback of this is, well, it pretty much comes down to instead of having just one piece of content that is available in multiple languages, you actually have multiple diff pieces of content, each of which has its own identifier. And it, can, it has a tendency to cause problems anytime you need to make references between pieces of content, or references between comments and piece of content, or any kind of relationships that take place as part of your content. It's going to be a little bit difficult. Also, there are parts of the content that will not be translated, typically images. And in this model, well, you will have one image that is there for, for the, the French node, one image for the English node. Maybe it's just a reference to the image, but you're actually st storing duplicate information. And all these, these duplicated pieces of content need to be somehow synchronized. This is not very elegant. On the other hand, we have field translation, and this is enabled by the entity translation module. And this is what I want to focus on a little bit more today, because this is something that is, is pretty new, it's pretty exciting, it's, it wasn't possible to do before Drupal 7, and many people don't know about it yet. So I want to tell you a little bit more what are the advantages of using entity translation, and what are the drawbacks as well. Before we get into entity translation and node translation, there's a couple of things that are common to all of the all of the translation mechanisms for content. In your content type configuration, you can choose how the content will be translated. So you could just say, well, this content does not have any language association. You could say that, well, each piece of content has a language but it doesn't get translated. This is particularly me meaningful when you have user-generated content, which will not get translated, but you want to just separate things so you know what's, what's in French, what's in English, what's in German, but there's no correlation between the French piece of content and the German piece of content. Then you have enabled with translation, which means that it's going to be using the core translation mechanism and you also have the entity translation mechanism, which is also available. Then for user interface, when you have, uh, when you are viewing a, a node that is, uh, that is of a content type which is translatable, you will have a translate tab, or in French, traduire, and you, you will just click on the tab, you have an, uh, an overview of what content, well, what uh, translations are available. If one is not available, you can add it, and if one is, uh, is already available, you can edit it. So the user interface at this point looks pretty similar for both mechanisms. There's some slight variations, but it, the difference is really in the way that it works internally. So for the field level translation, which works with entity translation, what we're working is we really we're working at the field level. And this is taking advantage of one of the, the new things that's in one in the new functionalities uh, that's part of Drupal 7 is the fields API. And if you look at the structure of the way the, the, the structure of the data stored in fields, you see pretty often well you, well, you always see this language code that's part, uh, part of the language structure, of the, the field structure. And if you wondered why is it there, well, it's there just so that we can save multiple values uh, in different languages. And it, so the, the ability to do that translation is part of the fields API. There's just no user interface for that. And entity translation is actually providing a user interface that lets us take advantage of this multilingual storage mechanism. The advantage of this is that we have a structure for st storing the content that 
is really semantically correct. There are things that get translated and they get saved in multiple languages. There are things that don't get translated and they are just saved once. Typically, you have text fields which get translated and you have image fields which don't get translated, although there are some cases where you want to translate images and there are some cases where you have text which will not get translated. So it's really up to you to set what is meaningful for your structure. So in the field configuration settings, you can decide for every single field, will this field be translated? And this is one, one more of these points where you really need to spend some time thinking what is meaningful for my very specific case. The advantage of entity translation is that it doesn't only work for nodes. It really works for any kind of entity. So it works for node, it works for users. So you can translate user profiles. It works for taxonomy terms. This is, I think, in my opinion, the, the, the use of entity translation where it really shines. And it provides a much better alternative than the IT9 taxonomy translation method, which is kind of more of uh, a solution that is grafted on, uh, on the taxonomy terms, but it doesn't really store the data, store the translations in a, in a semantically interesting way, well, a semantically correct way. Uh, with entity translation, you can also translate comments. Doesn't make much sense, but if you wanted to, you could. And of course, since it's built on top of the fields API, it really works with any kind of entity that can be, well, that can be, uh, that can have fields, that can be fieldable. So as I mentioned, all fields can be translated, and entity, entity translation also stores additional metadata about each individual translation. So when was it added? Who added it? Is it published? Does it need to be updated? But there are things that w don't get translated. The author, the promotion status, uh, creation dates, all these properties of nodes and other entities that are not fields. So most of them we don't care about it, but one of those, it's very important, is the title property. And the title of a, of a page, the title of a piece of content, is generally something that you really want to translate. It's not, it's not optional, it, you, it's a requirement. And just for this case, there's the title module. The title module lets you replace those, those text uh, properties and well, it replaces them with a field and kind of works transparently once you've replaced them. So when you load a piece of content, it will automatically load the value from the field and save it, uh, well, and set it to the title. So it works pretty transparently. And it works for node titles. It also works for taxonomy term names and descriptions. And as I mentioned, it works pretty transparently. There's just one case where it might be a little bit surprising and it's when you have listings. Because when you have listings, the, the database is queried directly and it's a little bit more difficult for the module to just do its magic automatically. So when you create a view where you want to select, uh, well, typically a, a view where you just want to show the, the title of a list of nodes, use the replacement field and not the original property. This is a little, a little tip. I'm making a slide just for this because I've seen a lot of people waste a couple hours of work just trying to figure out why things were not getting translated. So use the replacement fields, not the original properties. As you mentioned before, sometimes it's not possible to translate everything. Um, Translating is a lot of work. Translating content is a lot of work. And sometimes the clients, well, they, they just don't have the resources to do that. And sometimes you just want to show everything that's, even though it might not be translated. And with the, with the standard translation mechanism, this can be a little bit difficult to have that kind of fallback mechanism. But entity translation is actually providing great fallback mechanism where you can decide that if a piece of content 
is not available in the current language, then it will go through the list of, uh, of languages as they are defined and just pick the first language where the content is uh, defined. This is really a huge benefit when you have websites with a lot of content. Typically what we, uh, what we use this on is, well, for example, a product catalog where you have thousands of products which are not going to be translated. Um, and, but at the same time, you really want to show that content because there's a lot of information that is relevant to people even if they, if they don't speak the, the language uh, that the, the content is in. One of the questions that we get a lot is, well, so entity translation is this new translation thing that does it, everything. Do I still need IATNN? And the answer is yes, you do. Because entity translation really helps you work with translating content. But there's a lot of things that are related to content which are not content themselves. So for example, menus, also the fields that make up your content. They have properties like the, the label of the field, the description for the field. These are all texts which are kind of related to the content but are not content themselves. And so for all of these add-on texts, you still need IETNN, which lets you translate those. However, there, there's a couple sub-modules from the IETNN suite that conflict directly with, with entity translation. One of them is ITNN select, which filters out content which is not in the current language. And this really doesn't work, work nicely with entity translation. So disable ITNN select if you want to use entity translation. An R1 is ITNN taxonomy. It really does exactly the same function. Well, it provides the same functionality as entity translation, but just for taxonomy terms and does it in a way that really doesn't work that well. So if you're using entity translation for taxonomy terms, you don't need IETNN taxonomy. I think that IETNN taxonomy, given that entity translation now is, is now available, um, IETNN taxonomy should be deprecated. So it seems like entity translation really solves a lot of those common problems that people have had with, entity, with the content translation. But there's a couple of things that still need to be figured out. For one, the integration with other modules still needs some work. Typically for the user interface, for example, when you have the, uh, the overview of your content, you have a, a column that shows the language. And typically this is the language of the content. But when you have entity translation enabled, it kind of changes the meaning of that column. And it's only not, well, it's not the language of the content anymore. It's just the default language that the content was created in. And so it can be a little confusing for the editors who are just looking at the site. And, um, and so there's a couple, a couple adjustments that are needed. Another thing that doesn't work that well is revisioning. Because revisions are really per, per entity. And what we would like to have is revisioning per language. And this just doesn't work uh, that great. And this is a very, very difficult problem. I'm not sure that we can find a solution for revisioning with entity translation that works for Drupal, six, uh, for Drupal 7. This is something that we might be able to solve uh, before Drupal 8. But this is a very difficult problem. And also, menu items need to be translated separately. So you have your content and you have the menu item that points to the content. And usually with the standard translation mechanism, you can just have different menu items for different pieces of content. This works pretty transparently. However, when you have entity translation, you really need to s ha translate the menu items and translate the content. So it's a it's one more step. It's something that's not very elegant from the workflow. It's some, something that's kind of hard for the translators to work with. But overall, for many use cases, it's a great solution. We've been using it at Wunderkraut for a couple of months now. Well, uh, yeah, we started last fall. 
Uh, and since then, we've been using it pretty much exclusively. We're not using the content translation uh, from Drupal core anymore. It has a couple quirks that, that people need to be aware of when, when building sites, but it is really, uh, it, it really solves a lot of common issues. So I would really encourage all of you, if you, if you have a multilingual website, give entity translation a try. See, see how, how does it work? How does it meet your needs? And I think that it's, it's a solution that has a lot of, uh, that is very promising for the future. And I think that what we'll have in Drupal 8 will, will be based on a lot of those, uh, a lot of those new concepts. And now, step four, translating everything else. So we've talked about translating the user interface, and we've talked about translating content, but there are still a few elements of Drupal that don't fall into these categories. Things like locks and field settings, menu items, um, taxonomy terms are tr translatable with entity translation, um, but uh, also with I18N. So all these, all these elements here are translatable with the I18N module. Um, and just, just to give you a couple examples, so, um, oh, sorry, although I should point out that we do recommend using uh, entity translation for taxonomy terms just because uh, it's, it's more robust than the, than the I18N um, module. So the block translation module, which is part of IETN, uh, allows you to make blocks translatable, and it also lets you specify if you want your blocks to just show up in certain languages. So if your if your blocks are just targeting users who speak that language or are only available in certain languages, and the block translation UI is is now available right through the, the block configuration interface. In Drupal 6, we had to, to use that translation interface I showed you for the, for the user interface strings. So it's nice that now uh, this translate tab is here for blocks that you've made translatable. And also, like I mentioned, uh, blocks that you just want to tar target for users speaking a certain language, you can do that. So you can, you can change the visibility of the block to target certain languages. Um, also things like field settings. So field settings can be a bit confusing. Field settings are not fields themselves. They're, things like the, the label of a field, or the help text, or the default text. So you can translate these using the field translation module in the IATN suite. And the, the translate tab, again, is just added to each field, so it's, it's right there. Uh, you don't have to go to the translation interface UI and it allows you to translate the, the label and the help text, as well as the default text. Unfortunately for fields that are not um, provided by core, like if you're using the date module um, and there's additional field settings, you can't translate those yet with the, the field settings module. You'd have to do something custom. Um, and menus. Um, are something that you can translate using the menu translation module in the IHN n suite. Um, and sometimes you'll want to have completely different menus in different languages, and that's more common if, if, you're, if you don't have, um, if you have asymmetric sites, you know, if your menus aren't the same structure in each language. But if your menus are, are quite similar, it, it'll probably be a lot easier to manage if you just choose to translate the individual menu items. And you can, you can configure that on a per uh, menu basis. Um, and there's different types of menu items in Drupal. So 
if you're if you're using um, node translation and you're linking to a node that's in a particular language, then the the language of the the, the menu item is only going to appear in the language of the um, if the node matches the current language of the site. So then you're not going to be able to actually translate the menu item. It's only going to appear if you're viewing the site in the, the language of the node. Um, but if you're using entity translation or you're linking to views that are um, Sorry, if you're linking to a page that's just meant to be seen in a particular language, so if you have a view um, that's only targeted at users of a, of a certain language, then you can choose to only show menu items in one language. Um, and then if you have a page that is, is a, a generic page, like the home page, or if you're linking to um, an entity that's uh, that's using entity translation, um, then you can um, choose language neutral and then you can uh, translate the, just the title of the menu link. And again, you have a, a translate link to translate these things. Um, if you are setting up a multilingual site, there's a couple additional modules that you want to use in addition to the core modules, Entity Translation and IETN, which is mostly what we've been talking about today. So the, the localization update module is what will pull in translations from localize.drupal.org. So if you have uh, contributed modules installed and you have Drupal Core installed, there's a lot of translations that people have contributed for these uh, modules, and if you're using localization update, then you can pull these in automatically on your site. So I uh, highly recommend using this module. And the other uh, module that can be really useful is the localization client module, which provides an alternative for that translation um, interface uh, UI and this is a bit easier to use. It's embedded in the site, so if you come across a user interface string that's not translated, you can just translate it on the spot. So there are still a lot of outstanding challenges. As you saw today, there's so many ways of, um, so many user interface uh, user interfaces in Drupal for translating different aspects of Drupal, um, and that can be a big challenge for translators, especially depending on who's doing the translation on your site. Um, so improving the translation UI um, and translating custom elements can be still a huge challenge. Um, and there's a lot of work being done on this. Uh, the, there's a multilingual initiative for Drupal 8, um, and there's a, there's a code sprint that's happening this Friday and on Saturday as well, if you want to get involved. Um, and some of the work that's being done will hopefully ap apply to Drupal 7, like there's work being done on the entity translation module to improve the user interface. Um, and if you want to get involved, uh, there's also some, some boffs coming up this week that I recommend going to. So the entity property translation boff tomorrow, that's going to be talking about translating uh, properties like titles on, on entities. Um, there's a, a multilingual boff tomorrow at uh, 2 o'clock, and that'll be around like multilingual use cases, talking about um, answering questions. if if you have any more after today. Um, and then another boff on Thursday about um, configuration and translation. And, um, and then Friday and Saturday is the code sprint. So hopefully if you're interested in learning more or contributing, you'll, you'll come out to some of those. Um, and if you have any questions, um, there's now a, a multilingual book that is just about to be released. And so um, we're going to give a free copy to the person with the best question. The, the book is written by Kristen uh, Paul. And uh, it's not actually, I don't actually have the copy, but I'll get one to you uh, 
if you have the, the best question. So. Can you help? Oh, if anyone has a question, please use the microphone. Hi. Um, you talked about the entity relationship translation. Uh, and from what I understood from that, using the taxon, using that for taxonomy, you're getting a one-to-one -one relationship between all the, uh, all the terms for taxonomy. So for example, if I had a user searching SEA on my site, then they're going to get results. I could, in theory, return results for SEA, and I could retur return results for Steel. Is that true? Is that the way the relationship works for the taxonomy? Do you know? I can wait. I, I, I'm not sure I really understand the question. Could you re rephrase that? So the taxonomy, you're going to uh, enter a piece of content, and you're going to tag that with SEA. And in English, you're going to tag it with steel. OK. Right? Yeah. So when I do use a, a single search term within the search tool, am I able to programmatically get both pieces of content back using one search uh, search result. So uh, with um, with tags, this is particularly difficult because tags are just, well, I mean, it's called free tagging. So you, it's generally tags that are entered. They're not really structured in a way that they are translated. So what, what you can do in this kind of case is to just have tags that uh, that will be applied to content. And the tags themselves don't have a language. It's just that. The, it, for example, when you have a tag cloud which is limited to one to content of one specific language, it will automatically filter out the tags that don't that have not been applied to content in that language. So the the free tagging is kind of a special case. But if you have those uh, those categories as uh, strictly defined categories, acier and uh, steel then I think the, in, in this case, you really have just one reference to the term. And then it's, um, yeah, I, I, I think it, that. It can be interchangeable? They, they can be interchangeable. Okay, yeah. um, so at that point, you mentioned searching. Uh, this is a whole, a whole another issue, uh, multilingual search. There's, there's a couple adaptations that need to be done. Uh, but it's possible. Yes. That kind of leads into my next question, if you don't mind, uh, regarding searching. If you allow the, U if you don't pass the language parameter in the URL, and you have a default language, uh, if it slash en slash user returns the same results as slash user, based on the steps, the criteria that we met, well, how does that get rendered for uh, somebody searching within Google, let's say? Um, the search result is going to come back, and they hit just slash user, slash user without the language parameter in the URL. Uh, Drupal's not going to, Drupal is going to decide for the user what language to return, um, what language to display. Uh, th this is true, but when, when you have um, the, the, the selection method that is based on the URL, all the links that are generated by Drupal will always have a language. So the, the Generally, the, the links that will be indexed will be the ones that have the language parameter. Um, I, I'm not sure that this really covers all possible edge cases, but I, I don't think uh, I've never seen any problems with the. So, slash, slash en slash user and slash user is not going to be considered duplicate content by search engine index? I'm, I'm not sure. Hmm. I, I don't know the answer. Okay. Thank you. Hi. Thanks for the talk. I got a comment and two questions. Uh, comment is, I don't think you mentioned in the talk, but it, I think that uh, Drupal 8 is going towards the entity translation model. So it might be one, it might be something people should think about if they're choosing between the two, but that seems to be the direction of Drupal. Uh, yes. And two questions. Number one, can you publish a node in one language and not another? And the other question is, if revisioning doesn't work well now with entity translation, is there work being done to make it work well? What's the status of that? Thanks. OK, so the, um, the first question, if 
trans uh, specific translation can be published or not. This is possible. This is part of the, the base functionality from the entity translation, uh, well, the, the functionality. Um, in, in the standard translation model, it works pretty transparently because you have two separate nodes. One of them can be published, the other not. That, this is not an issue. What you cannot do, however, is unpublish the original and keep the translation published. But there's, there's few cases where this would make sense. Uh, the second question was? Oh, the second oh, revisioning. Yeah, yeah, the second question was about whether revisioning, there's plans to make revisioning work in Drupal um, 8. I think Gabor might be able to, to answer that, but I, well, it's, it's a very difficult question. I think that the, the perfect solution is not clear yet. I don't think there's a, a current problems with revisioning in the sense of it's not being supported. It is supported. I think the problem with revisioning multilingual content is basically you get an, a new revision for uh, any edit to any language version of the node. So basically you have a new revision for any language even though you have not edited the content for that language, um, which is not nice, but, it, but, the, but the revisions are tracked, all your changes are tracked and we can tell whether you actually made changes in one language or the other. So I have two quick questions. I saw that there's a pluggable architecture for the language negotiation where you can do it by user's choice or browser, et cetera. Um, how does that work with anonymous users and the page cache for, yeah. Um, you mean if, if the, uh, if user, if the user's profile is one of the methods of negotiation? For example, like if the browser is set to Spanish and the, the, it primes a cache for that page in Spanish and then mm -hmm. an English user comes to the page, will that user then see the cache page in Spanish even though they're an English user? Both anonymous. Okay, so um, there's one, one case where uh, one of those uh, detection methods where this could be the case is when you're using the session-based uh, language. Uh, so pretty much it saves in a cookie that you want to view the page in, in Spanish. Um, I think this would, in this case, it wouldn't work that well uh, with caching. Otherwise, since it's based generally based on the URL, uh, then the URL gets, uh, gets cached. So that means that the um, the Spanish version and the English version would get cached separately. Um, so th this would not be a problem. I know that also uh, front end, uh, well, uh, well uh, caching s systems like Varnish uh, also have some, some methods that, uh, some little tweaks that let you uh, keep, well, save different, different values for, per language. Uh, typically, the, where this could be problematic is for the front page because it's the same. This this is the one page that has the same URL in every language. Uh, oh. Otherwise, uh, it's generally not a problem. And then the second question is: If the, I have an existing multilingual site, is there an easy way to transfer it from the uh, node translation paradigm to the entity translation paradigm? So, for example, with taxonomies, is there an easy way to move all of that data into entity translations? Mm -hmm. there, there is an a entity translation upgrade module which tries to do that automatically. Um, give it a try, not on a production server. Um, but yeah, so uh, it, it's possible. Uh, generally, it's, well, it, it, it does require some work. So it's not something you can just enable it. Um, but yeah, it's possible to do that kind of migration. Thanks. Hi. Um, if we're building our own entity, do we need to do anything to expose that entity to this module, or does it just work uh, through field API and the core entity API? Um, so for the entity translation to work, well, the field translation to work, there's not, uh, there's not much that needs to be done. Mm -hmm. What you want to do is, uh, well, the, the user interface for translating those, uh, those pieces of content uh, or those entities that you created. Uh, you need to put that in place. But in, in most cases, it's pretty much uh, reusing some of the code uh, 
that's available for nodes or taxonomy terms. And mm -hmm. so there's there's not much that there's not much work uh, much work that that need uh, that is involved. Gotcha. Thanks. I just have 17 questions. No, I have one. <laughs> um, I was curious if either of you has built a site using entity translation and organic groups, and if so, are there any particular challenges with that? We have. We we actually discussed about it. we talked about this yesterday. Uh, no, we haven't done that. Um, the only case where we thought that this could eventually be meaningful is when organic groups are, are used more as a, a structure to to take care of uh, access restrictions. If it's if you use organic groups in a typical typical case where it's a discussion discussion group, then generally a discussion group will be in only one language. And so there there. There aren't that many cases where it is really meaningful to have multilingual groups. My use case is a bilingual school, so I don't want a Spanish kindergarten and an English kindergarten. I want one kindergarten classroom where everyone is together. Okay. Um, yeah. Yeah. So, uh, so I, I need it. <laughs> th there's definitely some some use cases like that. Uh, that uh, I mean, you you just need to like take a look at, at it. Um, yeah. I think it it should be possible. We haven't tried it. One more question. So I have a pretty specific question as it relates to non-Latin uh, character sets. Um, we built a site last year with seven languages um, and ran into a lot of the issues that you guys talked about. And one specific challenge has been around paths and redirects. Um, and we're having specific problems with not being able to use you know, Chinese or Japanese character sets in our redirects. Um, have you seen any workarounds or solutions for that? I, I haven't had any any similar cases. Uh, one thing that's very useful when working with languages that have uh, non non ASCII characters uh, is using the transliteration module, which pretty much replay creates uh, path aliases using ASCII characters. Uh, most languages have a, a substitute for uh, for those characters. I don't know how it works for Asian characters or like really non Latin characters. Um, yeah, I'm sorry, I don't have an answer. <laughs> There is a UI for oh. translation sets. You didn't mention it. What can you say uh, about A it? UI for translation sets? Yeah. Um, well, we, we did uh, talk about a number of uh, text groups that... Content translation? Um, maybe you want to come talk. I think we're out of time. Do, do you want to come and talk to us? After this, I think we need to, to leave the stage for the next okay. presentation. Thank you. Thank you.